Hello everyone, my name is Kelvin from the Council of the Hong Kong Law Wave Forum. First of all, on behalf of the HALF, I welcome all of you joining us here in the dialogue section of the Masterminds Masterclasses event. The purpose of this event really is to provide a platform for our young scientists like yourself and to connect with the world-renowned scientists and hopefully be inspired by them and sustain your research journey ahead. With a small group and comfortable setting, uh, you can discuss and exchange your ideas freely. So today, a huge thank you to our guest host. We are honoured to have Professor Dennis Lowe of the Chinese University of Hong Kong for taking his time and joining us here. Professor Lowe is the director of the Lee Ka Shing Institute of Health Sciences, the Lee Ka Shing Professor of Medicine and Associate Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Professor Lowe won the 2021 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences for his discoveries that fetal DNA is present in maternal blood and can be used for the prenatal testing of Down syndrome and a variety of genetic diseases. Professor Lowe also won the 2021 Royal Medal in Biological Sciences and he is the first Chinese scientist to win this medal in this category since the establishment of the award 200 years ago. And a big round of applause and welcome Professor Lowe. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, you're doing some research on fetal DNA and I would like to ask what could this research done on personalized medicine as personalized medicine is a very huge topic nowadays and people are discussing whether we could do specific treatments to uh, the patients. Just for myself, I'm working on research on molecular biology and then I'm studying some cancer biology in my lab and then uh, for my research, I thought that to personalize medicine, it is somehow to investigate some targeted drug to uh, target on head and neck cancer for my project. But I think quite interesting that if fetal blood could be uh, give some clues to the future disease or genetic disease, and could it be some very good promising uh, direction for personalized medicine? Thank you. Okay, so I think that um, a very general you know, definition of personalized medicine is basically how to uh, tailor make your treatment to specific individuals, right? So, so in other words, um, by knowing the fetal genotype beforehand, what can we do to treat the baby? And, and I think actually one of the simplest ones is basically, for example, blood group typing of the baby. Because uh, after I discovered the fetal DNA maternal blood in 97, uh, we actually thought, what is the first application? And the first application is actually, you know, in a Caucasian population, the blood group, you know, uh, ABO, apart from that, it's also positive and negative, right? The rhesus yes. plus and ne negative. As it turned out, in Caucasian uh, populations, 85% of people are rhesus positive, and 15% of people are rhesus negative. And if a rhesus negative mother carries a rhesus positive baby, then there's a chance the mother might be immunized and then will produce antibody to attack the baby. So, so basically, we, we show that um, you can basically use that system to tell if the mother's and baby blood group type matches each other. So, so there's one, one way you can use it. And, and of course, if you talk about circling DNA in general, some of our other work such as with Professor Tony Moksu Gam Gaosau, right? Because he, he worked on lung cancer. And so we showed that by using a blood test, I can actually tell if a, if a lung cancer will respond to a target therapy. So this is another, yeah. And there are probably many other examples, uh, yeah. So, so now in the, in the cancer liquid biopsy field, basically you have uh, many of those uh, situations in which you use it to select the best treatment. Something. Just like for, I recently did some genomic profiling on tumor cells, so I think the concept is to profile some of the specific uh, content of those particular tumor cells. And then similarly, I think for your research, maybe it is about the profiling of blood cells, but one of the major challenge of personalized medicine is the cost, in which Every patient vary a lot, and then could we have a good strategy to implement the personalized medicine, uh, consider, considering the cost of uh, assessing each patient's individual genomic data? 
I think it's difficult to generalize costs um, to any medical applications. I mean, some of those applications are actually quite cheap. Now, for example, like I mentioned to you about the Rhesus D genotyping, and that was just basically just a, a PCR, right? And a PCR nowadays, I think you can probably, with some DNA extraction costs plus the PCR, you can probably do it within 300 Hong Kong dollars. So I think that is a cheap test, right? And, and even for the, um, uh, the one with Professor Tony Mock to select target therapy for lung cancer, we use digital PCR, but digital PCR nowadays use a droplet machines, which as long as you have the machine, the actual PCR is also the same cost. So that is also something which you can probably do in a few hundred dollars, right? Um, but if you are talking about wanting to uh, profile the whole genome, then of course that would be more expensive. Yeah. But, but that said, uh, the dealing sequencing cost is actually coming down. So hopefully, you know, with increased competition, that would be better. Uh, for example, I don't know where you have uh, looked at, for example, some of the uh, latest sequencing uh, system, like the Nanopore, right, the Oxford Nanopore system. And one of those chips is only $2,000. So I think it's not too bad, yeah. So uh, I would like to ask a more general question. Uh, we are glad that we have so many young scientists here today, but we always want more people to join us. So uh, I would like to ask, how can we attract more young people to pursue a career in biomedical research? Yeah, I, I think that in Hong Kong, I think many of the young people, they look at career prospect. Of course, their parents look at career prospect. So as a result, I would say that still, um, probably the, the most uh, talented uh, people with the best examination results still try to go for professional subjects. If you are in biology side, many of them will choose medicine. So that's why I think every year when we hear the people with the, the best result, when we interview them, I would say probably 80 or 90 percent of them will say medicine, okay? But of course, hopefully in, in, the, in the future, uh, more of um, these talent students, or actually students in general, would, would tell us that they actually want to do biomedical research rather than just be, be a, a, a doctor. I think to do that, you really need an ecosystem where um, you have jobs, you know, it shows people that you can succeed that way. So that's why I think now it's important uh, for us, for this region, uh, to have our own companies in this area. Yeah, so they can show that people can uh, do well by founding their own companies, and then the companies will employ people, and then you basically have a career structure. Yeah. Thank you. Any follow-up questions? Actually, I have a follow-up question. Uh, do you think the commercialization of these technologies could potentially be disadvantageous for the people who are less like privileged in life and yet need these like medical? Um, treatments or yeah, I, I think that is a question which uh, every now and then people will ask. But I would say that um, the patents um, system is basically a bargain. So what is a bargain is that um, the promise is that the inventor will have a limited period of monopoly, which at the moment is up to 20 years, but in exchange for the information that that person has invented rather than say in the old days, um, you know, uh, men, some people just keep the invention secret. And if it's secret, then of course it will never go into public domain. But now at least you have that period in which after that your patent will be expired. And furthermore, there are some safeguards in the patent laws in that you cannot patent natural phenomena. So in other words, you cannot patent uh, the whole phenomenon so that people cannot penetrate. You only patent in one particular area using a particular technology, and people can always invent around it. So, so I think that is, uh, I would say that now we are in a reasonable arrangement. I wouldn't say it's the best, but, but still this is better than, than if, if you don't have motivation for people to make the invention known, then they'll just keep it secret. And furthermore, if there's no financial motive for companies or inventor, then I think the fuel will actually go slower. You know? yeah. Thank you. So next up we have uh, Jamie.
Yes, I also have a more general question. So, um, what do you think are the key characteristics for a young researcher, and then what do you, what advice do you have for them? Oh, I suppose you mean desirable characteristics, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so I say probably, I think it's a difficult question to generalize, but I think there's several things which is important, and then of course you have to be really interested in what you're doing, right? And for me, I actually look at research as a hobby rather than as a job. And I think that's important because some problem, you really have to be thinking about it, you know, uh, day in, day out, you know, even when you're off work, before you can crack it. And so if you just look at it as something that you do for eight hours a day, then it's probably difficult to make really the original breakthrough. And, and second is that I think it's important to have a very broad training rather than not to specialize too soon. Now, for example, like in the areas which I'm working on, say genomics, um, I require some medical knowledge, scientific knowledge, computational skills, mathematical skills, many different areas. So, so it's good to read uh, broader and try to interact or talk with people, yeah, which is important because you cannot think of everything yourself. And I usually have my best idea when I'm talking with colleagues or even friends. Yeah. Okay, another more general question. So I was wondering if you have any tips for young researchers who are still really early in their career and haven't established their place in the field to start their own research projects or initiate any new ideas they have. I think it's a good idea to think whether something is worth doing or how important is it, you know. Because there are many things you can do, right? Uh, but the problem is that you don't have infinite time. So it's usually it's important to prioritize. Okay, say that of these 10 things that I want to do for the next three years, which of them is the most important? And, and, then, and then, of course, if you're building a career, you can also think, okay, let's say in the best case scenario, so you can crack this, what will that do to your career? You know, is that something, is that a problem which is enough for you to crack for 20 years, for example? So how do you know if an idea is that solid? Or, or not the idea, but the outcome, the final result. Yeah. But of course, to ask the question is also uh, a skill. Because some people say that science is basically an art of asking solvable questions. So, so sometimes you cannot just say, well, you want to cure cancer. That would be very vague, right? Yeah. But you can, can try to go and home in some more specific questions which you say, okay, for the next 10 years, you could do, do this. So Thanks. we have uh, Wyman. Wyman, you can give me ask Okay, you thank you. So I think most of people will encounter this problem. So I want to ask, how did you identify your research interest? Yeah, now some of it is, of course, based on whether, I mean, you, you need to read broadly. You know, for example, you should subscribe to some uh, good, maybe general journals, and you read about it every week, right? and then talk with colleagues or friends and go to conferences and then hopefully you're home into something which interests you. But of course that is also an element of luck and chance. I mean, even for example in, in the area which I work most, sometimes it depends on who you meet. You know? Now for example, like um, in my area, one technology is very important to me is the PCR, polymerase chain reaction. So I happened, when I was a medical student, I happened to actually went to a lecture which was taught by one of the first person outside of uh, the original core group that invented PCR. Uh, that, that person was, was successful, he can replicate a result. Uh, and so I learned from that professor. You know, and that technology turned out to be very important in my career. Yeah. And then of course, I cannot control that, uh, whether I'm gonna meet that professor or not. Thank you. Hi, Professor Lo. Um, with the rapid advances in sequencing technology, how would you see the development of medicine in like five to ten years, and what are the big challenges? So I think DNA sequencing, um, you know, as we said just now, is getting cheaper and cheaper, and then it's getting to use more. Now, for example, like Hong Kong now, we have this uh, Hong Kong Genome Project, and many other places are doing their own genome projects. And so eventually, probably, you know, within 20 years, there may be many patients will have their own genome 
stored in the hospital you know, database. And so I think if that's the case, then there are probably many practice of medicine will be different. Now, for example, like at the moment, um, if you're guessing whether somebody might have a side effect from a drug, it's usually really by trial and error. You give the drug and you know, hopefully there's no side effect right, or adverse side effect. But in the future, probably the pharmacogenetics will be much more prevalent. Okay, and so that's one aspect. Another aspect which I think is going to be important would be things like polygenic uh, risk score. So in which the, you use multiple genes and polymorphisms to predict what is the chance that somebody might have heart attack or, or diabetes, that sort of thing. So I think that likely those will be implemented into the healthcare system right from the beginning. And of course, there are even some very controversial area. Now, for example, nowadays people say, okay, if polygenic risk score is so powerful, why don't you use that when you're creating IVF embryos? You know, if you create 10, there are even some companies which offer to choose the one with the lowest cardiovascular risk. And of course, that creates a lot of uh, ethical issue. Yeah. So the ethical side, the legal side, we need to come hand in hand with the medical side. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So that's what we have to render. Hello, Professor Lo. I know Professor Lo is very experienced in uh, translating your research into uh, real-life um, practical use. And uh, I think the Hong Kong government has also put a lot of support to um, help um, the industry and the academia to collaborate and to launch products to help people. Uh, however, I think um, there is a challenge between the academia and the industry because our goals can be very different in terms of research. Uh, so do, do you have any tips for young researchers how we can collaborate well with the industry partner or business partners in terms of um, uh, working on new projects and also new products? I think that the industry and academia probably the, some of the emphasis might be different, right? Or, or the way in which they work might be different. Now, I find that from my experience, of course, in academia, then people tend to be more relaxed in terms of time, right? Because they'll think, well, vaguely for the next three years, I might do X, Y, Z, right? Well, whereas in industry, it's different. I would say, okay, within these two weeks, you have to do this, and next two weeks, that. So that is a bit of difference. So that's why if you ever have a collaborative project with a company, then you need to start to you know, think carefully about the timeline, and look carefully about a contract. You know? So contract is not something which is nice to have. It's exactly they could you know, sue you if you don't stick to it. So those are important. And then things like confidentiality is another area. Yeah, because in, in company um, uh, business, usually they will have non-disclosure agreements. right? Whereas in the academia, then people, of course, try to be more open, try to disseminate information. So, so you have to very carefully balance those. Uh, but that said, nowadays, um, universities are increasingly aware of the importance of patents. And so with patents, you also have to file the patent before you publicly disclose. So that, once again, is probably moving a little bit towards the, uh, the industry side. Yeah, I think we, we just try to work with each other. But, but some of the other point, I think the, 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 the interests are aligned because both the uh, industry and academia, you try to be the first in the world, right? And of course, typically, if it's first in the world, then it's, you're probably also entitled to some strong IP and probably valuable IP. So probably uh, for researchers, we have to work faster and also to um, uh, work with the industry well and before, uh, and especially we have to discuss uh, more full roughly before starting kickstart the project. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe I have one more question. It is for research, it is different from, I think one of the major characteristics of research is we are doing things we don't know. And uh, although we could have some literatures or known facts to predict some of the, let's say, our hypothesis, test for our hypothesis. But in response to the previous question, it seems that for collaboration with industry, we have to have a concrete timeline. But actually, we are doing research that we don't know the results, maybe. Uh, is there any conflict between collaboration with industry and the concept or the, the value of doing research? I mean, Maybe we don't know the results, we will fail, and then we need a lot of try and errors. Is it conflicting with industry collaboration? Okay, now, of course you say uh, during research, 
you don't know anything, right? That you talk about in academia, but that may not be strictly、uh, true. If you think about what you're doing, because usually, now for example, when you write for grants, okay, you're supposed to explore the unknown. But yet, actually, many people because they want to make sure the grant is have deliverable, which the grant giving body will accept. Then usually there is a risk spectrum. You know, they know that they could deliver this. Now, for example, let's say that you're going to study the characteristics of a particular disease. Let's say COVID. Okay, and and even though you don't know about COVID. But but you know the stuff that you're going to the data you're going to collect, you can collect it, right? For example, you want to talk, talk about the age distribution of COVID, what is the time cost of COVID, what percentage of people will die, etc. etc. You know those those you know you can get. So basically, what I'm saying is that even though something may seem to be quote unquote unknown, but actually there are something which is which you you know you can get. And also some of the areas like in academia would do. Clinical study as well, right? And in a way, those clinical studies—let's say you want to recruit 500 people to do this—but that also is organization. It's, all, it's also like industry, right? So it's basically talk about organizational work. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, young scientists who just joined us here today. And we were actually doing the dialogue section with Professor Low, and our young scientists were asking questions to Professor. So now let us resume our section by allowing you guys to ask your question. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, uh, I just want to ask, uh, how long, uh, or in which way you found, uh, your, uh, research, uh, field you interested in, your interested research field, how you found it. Basically, I think sometimes, you know, I. I find the area by say reading journals, and also by basically interacting with、uh, teachers and other fellow students. And and of course sometimes there's of course an element of luck because you may not happen to know the person or that teacher. You may not have happened to be in that lecture of somebody, you know. And and so that that chance encounter sometimes will. Basically affect your life, right? Because just now before you came, I was、uh, telling a story that、uh, when I was a medical student in Oxford, I actually once、uh, went to a lecture by a at that time very young、uh, scientist、uh, who has now become a professor in Oxford, called Professor John Bell, who is a Regius Professor of Medicine. So he was talking about a technology which was new at that time called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And I remember the lecture. He said that this technology is going to change the world, and so I listened to that, and I, I believe him. And so after the lecture, I went down to him and asked him to teach me how to do PCR, and then which he very graciously did, and and they taught me the te technique. And so that was my first toy, so to speak, right? Because you know when you're a young person, you like to play with toys. So that's my first toy. And I remember actually the first ever book on PCR. I, I was. I have a chapter in there as a medical student. So that's how you you do this. And and I wouldn't know how to engineer the encounter of me and and Professor John Bell. You know. So sometimes it's like this. You know. Or even in in a meeting like this, it happened that today something you hear, and that actually you said okay you're interested, and then you're going to work on it for the next ten years. So how we have Queenie. So what's your question for Professor Low? So、uh, hello, Professor Low. I'm Queenie from CHK. So may I ask, how do you balance your roles as a clinician, a researcher, and also an entrepreneur in your research studies? Especially, how to translate your findings into actual real-life applications? I think that actually, in different times in our career, in our life, you probably will spend more time on one or the other. Now, so for example, in the clinician side of me, so I remember that、um, so after I graduate. As a medical student, I worked one year as a houseman, and then I spent three years working as a PhD student, and I went back to do internal medicine. So, so, so that was, in a way, important to me to because I think that、uh, to support my work, I need a certain level of clinical expertise because I need to know what, you know, what the、um, the patients need. Okay, I need to have the a role in the hospital to to build the collaboration. Uh, network, and so I did that. And after that, now, for example, I spend most of my time on the actual 
research side and also on the patenting and the commercialization side. So different times in your life, you tend to do different things. And on the balance, I think that, but at the end of the day, I think you need to enjoy what you're doing. So, so I don't think it's, uh, it's wise to overstretch yourself, right? To try to split your 24 hours too thinly among the different subjects because you might not do well in any of them. Yeah, so I try to focus on something which I think the most important at that moment. Thank you. Any, any follow-up questions for Professor Lo? Then next up we have uh, Noel. You may ask your question to Professor Lo. Sure, thank you. Um, hi, Professor Lo. Um, I'm Noel from CHK, um, from the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics. Um, I was wondering, do you find um, yourself like um, perhaps like being in a very like lonely like in your research field? And um, for example, for me, I actually do cope with like different challenges or like different difficulties like during the research. So I was wondering like how do you sort of like cope with all those like difficulties and do you actually feel lonely like during all the process? Thank you. That's why teamwork is important. I think we work as a team to, to research. Uh, for example, now I work in the science part most of the time. And then basically most of my team is there within, you know, 30 seconds of my office. So if, if I encounter difficulties, I like to brainstorm with people. And also I remember actually when I was in the UK, um, they have a very nice habit of having morning tea and afternoon tea, right? <laughs> and I think actually we should do that more often because I think that is one way in which you brainstorm. And also of course that will take the loneliness away. But luckily, in, in, in Hong Kong, we also like our dim sum. So, so that's why we, 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 we tend to ask people out for a meal, and then we can talk about things together. Yeah. So we have actually finished the first round question, but we have a little bit more time left. So uh, anyone of you would like to ask further questions for Professor Lo, anyone? As a PhD student, I'm learning how to write a study portrait code, but unfortunately, sometimes we face failure. It's uh, very difficult to sell our research idea to other investigator or people to fund your study. As a PhD student, what would you do so that you can revise your study protocol to make it better? I think it's usually helpful to try to put yourself in the shoes of the other party. Yeah, that is important. So, so this, you should actually transcend your current role and let's say that if you're on the other side, if you're the funder, what would you say? Why? If, imagine if you're the guy who is going to uh, approve your protocol or otherwise. If that person is looking at 10 other applications, why would you all stand up? So always try to do that. And, and I find that that role playing helps in many occasions. You know, for grant applications, when you go for interviews, or even coming to a session like this. You know, I, I would try to put myself in your position. What would you like to know? What would you like to understand? But of course to improve your chance, I think the the language skill is important. You need to be able to write well and fluently. So, so usually I teach my students, if you can say something in two words, don't use three. Try to make it very concise. And try to use a nice figure, you know, colorful. You know, even when you're drawing the figure, try to be outside of the box, you know. Thank you. Professor right. would you mind sharing with us uh, what would you do if you are very stressed? <laughs> How to really stress? Well, but unfortunately, I'm, unfortunately, I'm one of those persons who, if I'm stressed, I like to eat. <laughs> so, this, so this one thing. So if, if Lois is from my lab, so she knows that uh, we go to also a very interesting restaurant. So, so it's one thing we do. And then, um, also believe it or not, I, I also like to play video games. I've always been playing when I was uh, <laughs> Uh, a, a small kid, because I, I find that playing video games is almost like solving projects. You know, when one level, another level, is a similar thing. And then, apart from that, I like to uh, watch movies, because I think w during watching movies, I was sucked into a different dimension, a different place, and then that freed my mind to think. I, I remember Professor Lowe found out the DNA from the Harry Potter movie. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask what's your latest movie that you'd recommend to us? <laughs> well, actually, um, recently I watched uh, quite a bit of Netflix. Mm -hmm. And actually, this particular week, 
there's a new series called Arcane, A-R-C-A-N-E, which is surprisingly good. I mean, the, the, the imagination is unbelievable. It's actually based on a video game, it's called yeah, League of Legends, League of Legends yeah. which, which even though I've never played that <laughs> game, but, but this series is really amazing. If you have a subscribed Netflix, I recommend you go and take a look. <laughs> episodes coming up too. Yeah, yeah. Six now. Yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I watched that too, that's good, that's good. Yeah. So, uh, Crystal, you were having a question, right? I, I heard many people saying that doing a PhD is like uh, in a hell. <laughs> and then, what do you think about it? Do Your you PhD think, is being hell? Uh, <laughs> to me? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say, I think PhD is really good fun. It's actually probably one of the best times in my life, actually. Yeah. Is that because it was right after the house officer year, or? <laughs> um, that could be it. You know, when I was uh, doing my house officer year, um, that one of my job was 120 hours a week. So PhD is of course not, not that amount. But but I think PhD is, is good fun because you know you you have done your bachelor degree, so so you have some f fundamental knowledge, and basically you have uh, three or four years in which you can just go reasonably free. But of course, the, the most important thing I think with PhD is that your, your wavelength with your uh, supervisor is important. You need to be you know, match with each other, you know. So, so I think that if you have yet to find your supervisor, I think that is a very important time. You have to say, okay, uh, can, what is it like to work with this person for the next three or four years? Hi, Professor. Um, talking about uh, industry versus academia, I'm interested to know, um, given the same research interest, um, how should I choose between entering the academia or the industry after my PhD? Of course, academia, you know what it's like because, uh, you know, the university has been functioning here for decades, so you know roughly what is the uh, career path. But industry, for this part of the world, I think it's a more reasoned thing, right? So you need to think, well, before you join um, or want to go into the industry, what, what do you actually mean by that? Uh, do you mean that you have uh, your own idea, you want to be a founder of a company? Okay, so if that's the case, then, then it can attract a particular type of uh, people, okay? Because at the end of the day, maybe 90% of all the startup will fail, right? So it will attract person with particular risk appetite. Or if you want to join some established companies, then you have to think, well, uh, what is the track record of those companies, right? Are you going to be uh, happy um, doing that job, you know? So, yeah, so I think you need to think carefully, yeah. How about, um, we finished from uh, asking questions by the uh, young scientists. So, uh, Professor Lo, uh, you have been uh, doing research for almost like 30 years. And I think being a, a student or being an uh, undergrad has been uh, sometimes a, a dog, right? So do you have any questions actually for the young scientists to try to know, the, uh, know what they're doing or do you have any specific questions for them? Yeah, so for example, so how do you decide whether you're going to go out into the society to work after your bachelor degree or how do you decide what's the one thing or, or several things which make you want to do a postgraduate studies? Uh, like what you just said multiple times just now, it's a matter of luck. Because for me, just like you, I've attended a conference in the UK um, when I listened to a really inspiring lecture on gut microbiota, which really have changed my life because originally I'm doing Chinese medicine, but then now I've jumped into the world of uh, medical science in a Western field. It's a matter of luck and uh, perseverance to pursue this career for me. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I, I haven't started my postgraduate <laughs> yet. <laughs> I'm still in oh, undergraduate. See, <laughs> so, yeah, that's just drawing more seminar. I can share a little bit because I'm actually from, I did my bachelor in um, biotechnology um, in CUHK as well. Um, I feel like the reason that I choose um, as being a researcher is because of the supervisor that you have encountered with. Um, for example, like for like during my bachelor, my supervisor, it's, I still remember like he is actually um, um, doing zebrafish as the animal model. 
And then it was quite interesting that like uh, whenever I was having a meeting with him, he would be like sharing a lot of like different kind of like interesting scientific findings with me. So for example, he, uh, once he was um, sharing with me like uh, there is actually a gene which is determined whether you're gay or not. And I just find it, this is really interesting. And um, he is one of my sort of like mentor that persuade me to continue my uh, master in Imperial. And then um, I was really lucky to be um, in Imperial and sort of like to explore, um, expand my horizon in terms of my scientific field. Um, and then I met another professor, uh, Professor Dillo, and who sort of like um, inspired me um, to do more research in the uh, reproductive field. So that's why I come back to Hong Kong for my PhD and I'm doing PhD and right now I'm doing my postdoc with Professor Ronu Ma. So I think it really depends on the people that who has been inspired you throughout your research lifetime. I was really lucky to um, have met up a lot of like mentor. So yeah, this is my reason um, of like why I've been like keep on pursuing my sort of like my, my journey so far. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> yes, because for me, because I always like to explore and I think research is a fun adventure. So every day is new and then we always don't know what's going to happen next, so it's always fun. Mm -hmm. Very good. I think um, I like the boys, military the boys, because we are studying in a <laughs> career oriented program and then we do not have much content about research. So my experience is just a spark. Oh, from the movie, the soul. I, I'm not so sure if you heard of a cartoon, which is called Soul. It is called, uh, about finding the spark in our life. I think mean, it's too general. Uh, I cannot really understand what is spark. But for me, I think what is spark is the moment I think what I would like to do. And then, of course, I will be a radiographer. But besides this, I have other hobbies. And then in my year one, I find uh, I thought that could I do something in lab? Just one question. Actually, not many things induce my thinking about research, but I try to approach the supervisor and then I ask him if I could join the lab by saying I'm good at washing beakers. <laughs> I'm very good at washing anything. I could I join your lab and then keep on, let's say, washing glassware to contribute into your lab. And then, fortunately, he allowed. And then, Soon I find there are a lot of dishwashers in the lab. <laughs> then, so I start to do my project. I was thinking that research is finding something unknown. I, find, I feel very excited to find something unknown because to me, I think I'm exploring some uh, new stuff. But for my program, I'm not saying my program is not bad, it's a good program. But we study things and then study from known things. But for research, we study from unknown things. And then there may be failures, a lot of failures, really. And then, but I find after each fa uh, failure, I improve something, and then just a bit. And then after another failure, I improve a bit. And then after the whole journey, I improve a lot. And I think I can find some achieve uh, some excitement, and then my interest of research is just a spark. I'm not so sure if I deliver uh, <laughs> very concretely, but. Yeah, it's the best. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from, from what I heard just now in the past hour, I, I can only imagine how much hard work you guys actually have put into your research over your scientific journey. So I actually have one question for maybe Professor Lowe or other students. How do you actually deal with like the so-called work-life balance? You know, because I'm pretty sure that you spend a lot of time in the lab or in the study, right? So how, how, what, what do, you do you do in your leisure time? Man? How do you deal with the balance between the hard work that you put in the lab and the, the, the personal life that you have? Maybe we start with Professor Lowe and then we can have one or two students to answer the question as well. So as I mentioned, I basically look at my research as my hobby. hobby yeah. so, so to me, it's... Uh, part of my life, right? And and yeah, and I don't feel you know stressed thinking about it all the time. So one thing. And also I'm fortunate that my wife is also a scientist. And so that helps because at least the two uh, two of us well, we all go to conferences 
and we have written papers. We have even written papers together. So, so that also helped. Yeah, so, so she would understand why I need to stay up late. Yes. And she would stay up late as well. So, yeah. I used to think about it a lot, like work-life uh, work balance when I was in undergrad in Canada. But then after coming back to Hong Kong, and then I don't think we need to um, separate them like deliberately because it, as I said, if you like research, it's part of your life and then basically don't need to separate work and life anymore. I would say a substantial amount of caffeine. <laughs> 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 so me and James is actually from the same like, All right. yeah. department, so we actually drank a oh. drank a lot of coffee like every single day. So that sort of like make us like stay awake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so I think the question side maybe we can we can just pause on the question side. How about you guys get some time just to discuss freely whatever you guys want? Um, even not in English is fine. I, I understand most of you guys actually can speak Cantonese or English, whatever language you prefer. You can just have some maybe 10 to 15 minutes, some free time discussion time so that uh, you may want to ask more uh, about Professor Lo or even ask other students, uh, other, other young scientists questions. For people doing research, they encounter failure or hurdles all the time. So when will you decide to give up or change your research direction? Uh, what is the moment that makes you want to give up? <laughs> and do other topics? I think that if I'm satisfied that I really have, you know, have not turned any stones, you know, have not left any stones unturned, so, so that was the time, yeah. But of course, how you decide what that time is, is, is difficult, you know. You, you do have experience also counts, you know. And for example, there's some project which right from the beginning, I will not feel optimistic, you know, for example, you know, Put, talk to Lois, you know. You know <laughs> even when, when we first start, we will already, you know, think or project what is the likely success. Okay, and of course, just I also mentioned how important um, that project is. Is another thing which will also gauge that, because you say, okay, if, if this outcome, even the best case scenario, is only going to solve a little bit of the big problem, then of course the threshold for giving up would be much lower, right? I ask this question because I am currently working in the Dr. CM1 lab about a molecular research about a protein and that protein function uh, is quite controversial in, in the, in the paper, paper works there. There are some papers that there is no, no such function and there are some papers support that function and I was quite, uh, you know, confusing. Okay, now, so this is an interesting one because Sometimes I, I see those papers as well. For example, like I'm um, editor of some journals, and sometimes I handle paper like that. And of course, you need to be thinking about if you're on the other side of the editor, on, on the editor side, then what will happen? Let's say three previous papers say there's no function, and two say yes, and now you do your work. And then, of course, you could be either on other camp. Then how would that change the world? So you need to think about that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe three versus three over four versus two. You know? So, so that, that is the, the, the thing which I'll be thinking about if I'm on the editor side, you know. And then, of course, that will mean tricky for you. It's difficult for you. It means that even if you solve that, people may not believe it, unless your solution is so convincing that you, I can throw away the previous five papers and just believe in your paper. project. 因為我做血的DNA 有時你又不行
嘅同一個 sequence， 但係唔同嘅 biochemical modification。咁我哋二零零二年嗰陣時咧，就有個 postdoc 就 propose 話，不如用 epigenetic 咧嚟做 B B 仔嘅 testing。咁但係嗰陣時個 field 其實未 reach that level 噶嘛。咁變咗張 paper 咧，就係、是、成日都俾人 reject 嘅。咁但係到而家即係十幾年之後咧，咁而家其實個啊 ，dominant technology for 某啲 liquid biopsy 嘅 screening 咧，係 epigenetic base 咯。咁但係當然，如果你係個 postdoc， 你有有十五年，人哋覺得你嗰啲嘢唔得咧，咁啊對你 career 唔係幾好咯。咁所以 ，it's a difficult。咁你有冇話而家有啲咩 feel？ 你覺得係好似十幾年前嘅 epigenetics is underdeveloped now， but has potential？ 譬如有一個就 up to 幾年前都係 underdeveloped， 即係 genome editing， 因為以前啲 technology 係好 tedious 噶嘛。因為最早期，你如果要改個基因，你用一啲叫做係 homologous recombination 嘅方法，你可能係個機會率係十個喺度七分之一。咁但係跟住有啲人咧就 develop 啲第啲 technology 啦，譬如叫 talent 嗰啲 technology 去,去改嗰啲基因。咁但係又好難做嘅。咁直到 CRISPR 嚟啦，咁跟住咪就成個 feel 就就 take off 咯。咁你見到你，但係嗰度你講緊係。誒、uh, several decades 咯 ，right？ 有另一個 example 就係 stem cell 咯，嗱，譬如 stem cell 原本啊 John Gurdon 去做喺嗰個 amphibian t e l e f r o g 度做咧，係講緊五十年代六十年代，咁但係好難嘅喎。跟住到 Dolly 啦，咁你諗下五十年代六十年代到九九七年 Dolly， 咁到二零一二年 Yamanaka 先做咗嗰個 induced pluripotent stem cell， 咁、那個 field 咪 take off 咯。即係有時你要等係幾十年咯。咁你諗下，如果 John Gurdon 後屘要攞到 Nobel Prize with 啊 Yamanaka， 但係佢係講緊幾十年，即係要等幾十年先攞到個獎。又譬如幾年前你個 Living Battery 嗰位人，咁佢係到唔知九啊七歲先攞到 Nobel Prize。咁因為你好多年前係冇啲 smartphone 噶嘛，佢唔使用 Living Battery。咁但係而家就 realise 要重要性咯。誒，有冇啲事情你係做完之後你會覺得啊，如果可以再改善，會做得更加好？有時會嘅，其實嗱，即係難度咧，就係我就同佢講話。寫係幾好重要嘅嗱，我自己咧係 reasonably good 嘅 writer， 咁但係有時 nowadays 因為我的 group 大咧，有時唔係誒，我冇可能寫曬所有 paper 咁啊，即係有時啲學生要 train 噶嘛，咁有時有啲人咧 ，unfortunately 佢嗰個 the way to write 係冇咁清楚嘅，咁有時我會覺得咦。如果我寫嘅會唔會好啲咧？即係有時會有個諗法咯。即係好似我自己對 way 嘅 look 嘅咧，就好似你有粒係啱掘出嚟嘅鑽石，但係邊個雕琢佢咧，其實會令到你最後嗰個鑽石嘅價值噶嘛。有時寫 paper 就係個雕琢過程咯。嚇，咁有幾張 paper 誒，我哋出咗，但係佢可能因為 the way is written 咧，令到啲人咧唔 understand 佢多啲，亦都令到佢可能冇人咁多人細啊 ，exactly 會有時候有啲咁嘅諗法咯。咁點樣去 improve the writing skills for those of us not as naturally talented？ 咁<笑><笑>其實所以要係要 critique 咯，即係你寫完出嚟之後，可能你俾多幾個人睇，大家要 frankly 話睇睇究竟點解呢張 paper 喺呢度好啲又唔好啦？嚇！咁所以係係難嘅，即係 I think it's just have to 即係幾乎係一個 piece of art 啊！即係你畫完幅畫出嚟，要好多人睇，好多人慢慢評。有時亦都可能 over the years 會慢慢會唔同嘅，啊，即係有啲 work 咧，你開頭睇覺得好好複雜唔得身，但係有啲越睇越好嘅，啊，即係例如譬如我個 group 最近有個學生出咗張 paper， 嗰張 paper 係 so complicated 咧，得我懷疑啲 co-author 咧，包括我在內咧，都未完全 understand 曬所有啲嘢，咁但係你睇完出完一年之後咧，而家開始明白，即係即係開始明白多啲咯，啊，問一問即係。back to 頭先個問題，即、就、係、是、做一個 pioneer 其實係好難嘅一件事啦。即、就、係、是、尤其是好似你一開初做 fetal DNA 咁，其實個 worldwide community 未必 accept 得好好嘅。咁你點樣去 tackle 呢種 situation， 同埋點樣令到身邊嘅人即係、就是、persuade 到個 community 去接受咧？有時係難嘅，即係有時 it just takes time 嚇。即係譬如最初我係 fetal DNA， 咁啲人開頭諗住你淨係可以做誒。Uh, 誒男女 sexing 啊，佢諗唔到你點樣去 feel 啲嘢，你可以做到 Down syndrome 嘅理由，就因為 Down syndrome 你係有個細胞，你嘅數嘅細胞裏面有幾多條 chromosome 咯。咁佢諗住，如果你冇細胞，冇個細胞 membrane 嘅，咁你點數咧？咁有啲人諗住諗住唔得咯。咁所以你
係好難㗎。即係譬如我開頭，我記得翻香港嗰時，第一個 grant 啫，係俾人 reject 嘅。咁而嗰個 grant 係講 field DNA 嘅，咁所以有時係有個 challenge 喺度咯。又甚至我記得，譬如我鼻咽癌咧，我第一張 paper 出鼻咽癌出完之後咧，有個加拿大嘅 group 咧就話咧，我哋做錯啲嘢。咁佢係寫一封信去啦，就去話啊點樣唔得。咁而最 interesting 嗰封信咧，深刻咧就揾我其中有一個 collaborator 去 referee 喎。咁而個 collaborator 都唔信我哋得喎，即係嗰個 disappointing， 因為佢都係 co-author 嚟噶嘛。咁 of course now with history now is basically demonstrate to 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 work。所以有時你係需要有 confidence in work 去 persevere， 亦都顯示到咧，你點解做嗰陣時要好小心咯？因為如果做嗰陣時唔夠小心咧。即係又做 shaky ground 咧，如果人哋 challenge 下你咧，你可能就冧嘅咯。我想問下咧，頭先你話有一個學生就做到個 result 係 negative， 但係你就死心不息，就覺得佢應該係有嘢嘅。咁、嗯、如果我做 experiment， 第一次 negative， 第二次 negative， 第三次 negative， 佢不停 negative， 咁有啲乜嘢可以令到你覺得佢係 positive 嘅咧？唔係，其實我哋嗰陣時係轉咗啲嘢嘅。即係做完誒 negative 個 approach 之後咧，我哋係轉咗啲嘢，令到佢 positive。咁亦都有少可惜嘅，因為嗰個 project 咧係 probably one of the best project which I've ever given to a student。即係嗰個 student 淨係做嗰個 project 咧，佢可能做到 professor。咁但係結果俾咗另俾咗另一個 student 啦，即係即係嗰個嗰個 glory。有時就係有呢一個咁嘅 issue 喺度咯。所以即係所以你一來嗱，你你要好小心好叻啦，但係第二咧、那個運氣都重要嘅，即係變咗第二個 student 咪變咗係。冷手執個熱籤堆咯。同埋我都想問，即係有時咁同頭先大家 discussion 都睇到，其實做 research 真係天時地利人和都好緊要。咁變咗有時一個 project 可能都未必一定可以 work out 到。咁變咗可能我哋做啲 young scientist 有時可能要 handle 多一個 project。咁但係 handle 多一個 project 嘅時候，又可能個擺喺每一個 project 嘅時間又未必有咁多。咁你會俾啲咩 advice 我哋係即係可以？比較誒 efficient 咁樣去做嘢，同埋可以 handle 到 multiple 嘅 project。所以我估亦都係個 prioritize prioritization 咯。即係譬如我當你同我成日做三個 project， 咁你就要話俾自己聽，咁邊個最重要嘅？同你 supervisor discuss 咗呢個最重要啦。咁你就大部分時間喺呢一個，同埋嗰個 timeline 會係點咯？咁、嗯、有時譬如呢啲情形之後咧。有時我哋個 lab 咧，我會諗埋啲 issue， 即係譬如今年我其實有一張 paper 好重要嘅，咁我同啲學生講一定要今年出到，因為有時你譬如二零二一年出同二零二二年出咧係差好遠嘅，即係之後細你係 is is a whole year difference。因為如果你係 on the same year 咧，因為如果譬如二零二二年一月出，咁嗰張 paper 有你啲對手咧可以有成年時間同你爭嘅，但係如果二零二一咧咁就搞掂啦。咁所以 that's why 譬如今年我有個學生有個咁嘅 project。咁佢咪一定要今年搞掂？咁我會計埋條數啦。譬如你而家今日十億，我就要 referee 幾個禮拜翻嚟，跟住改完之後 referee 要多幾個禮拜，跟住我當佢要排版六個禮拜，喺喺十二月廿四號嗰期出得到咧，即係要諗啲咁嘅嘢咯。Thank you, thank you all, thank you, Professor Lo. Thank you. May I invite Professor Lo to wrap up our session, and maybe you can share a few words of wisdom or your experience to the young scientists here today. So I'll say that basically, you know, I think I believe that actually that many people have said the 20th century is the century of physics, but the 21st century is the century of biology. So I think now is really the golden time, you know. So so I'm very glad that all of you have decided to join us. And I hope that you know you'll have fun in your, you know, biomedical research career. Thank you.